First, I want to thank all of you for inviting me to join Deaf Expo. It's been lovely to be in your community and what a great day. I had a chance to see the displays, meet the people that were attending the Deaf Expo, to be in that environment where American Sign Language is the language of use. It's been beautiful. And thank you so much, Greg, for your inspiring uh, presentation. I used to live in the Northwest Territories, and I worked in a number of areas in the Northwest Territories in Nunavut. And as I was listening to you uh, talk this morning, I was just thinking, yes, that's exactly the situation there. So thank you for that. I'd also like to thank the interpreters who are working today. And I also think it's important that we also recognize the deaf community. So I always like to acknowledge the community that I was raised in, so to speak. I grew up in the deaf community in Edmonton. Edmonton was my first deaf community, and I'd like to thank them. I often worked in Vancouver as well, and both of those communities have taught me about their language and culture. We moved to Ontario. I had a chance to be part of their deaf community. And in each deaf community that I'm part of, it builds my understanding of language and culture. So thank you to each of those communities for sharing with me your language, your culture. So maybe you're thinking, why is it that someone who's hearing, who's been an interpreter, is going to talk about learning and education? I think it's important to say a little bit about my background. Yes, I am an interpreter. I still interpret, even though I'm old. And I was an elementary school teacher. My first degree is in special education, which means that I've had the experience of directly teaching deaf children and deaf-blind children. Given that experience of being able to relate to the children directly in American Sign Language, and then seeing what that looks like in contrast in a mediated environment where there are interpreters working. I'm intensely curious about those differences between mediated and direct education. Here in Canada, we increasingly see that deaf students are included in what are known as inclusive situations across Canada. And my question is this, what does inclusion mean? What does access mean for deaf children? So several years ago, I was granted uh, research funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council in order to do a national study of interpreted education here in Canada. So today, I'll show you some of the results of what does it look like when it's mediated versus direct instruction. Next slide, please. We've got an hour this afternoon, and so it's very challenging to uh, put all of this research into one hour. But just as Greg was talking about how difficult it was to put everything that he could offer in just one hour, I'm going to try my best to give you the highlights. I'd like all of us in the room to think about what is an accessible education. For many schools, they think, well, we've hired an interpreter. That's perfect. But when we think about learning, we think about the social environment of learning. We think about the comprehension and the intellectual aspects of learning. So there's much more to learning than simply hiring an interpreter. The other thing to look at is that if a child has an interpreter, what does that really mean? And what does that look like? Even on the hands of a great interpreter, we still have challenges with the interpreting process. And we've got both great interpreters and interpreters who are less than qualified in my study. I'll also be able to look at learning strategies. And so we're going to talk about all of those things in just one hour. I always like to get a handle on who my audience is. Can you identify if you are deaf, if you are not deaf? And I know that some of you in the audience who are hearing, you can sign. I often refer to you as a ruined hearing person. You're a little bit of a spoiled hearing person. You know how to sign. Let me check with you. You know sign language as well, too. Okay. And we've got someone here at the front who does not. It's helpful for me to know who I'm actually speaking with this afternoon. So let's open the discussion and talk about some of the challenges that are part of an interpreted or an inclusive education. 
In this triangle, you'll see at the very top, classroom instructors are typically, of course, in an inclusive environment, hearing, and they often have very little familiarity or formal experience or training in how to work with a deaf or hard of hearing child. So that's one of the first challenges, and I'll say more about that as we go on this afternoon. The middle part of that triangle speaks to support. And across Canada, we see that many provincial governments are experiencing cutbacks in education, and often quite severe cutbacks. The question then has to be raised, how does that impact services for a deaf child? And it's a huge, huge challenge in getting sufficient support and resources for deaf children in inclusive environments. A further section of this triangle talks about the child who is deaf or hard of hearing and asks the question, how do we know that they're ready for an interpreted education? How do we decide that they're ready for mediated instruction? And finally, the last portion of that triangle talks about is it possible to interpret in this classroom? We have emerging research as well that speaks to how do you audit a classroom to determine whether in fact interpreting is appropriate in this classroom. Next slide, please. So obviously there are a number of complexities in education. Many of you have experienced school in this particular school where we're presenting today and so maybe the learning was challenging, but you had social connections to other deaf children, you had social connections with teachers. Those pieces of education are critically challenging. And in today's child's environment, often when they are placed with an interpreter, what we have to look at is, is the child ready? For example, can they read and write at the same level as their hearing peers? One of the requirements that we're seeing in my research study is that the children who read and write on par with their hearing children have more strategies to deal with a mediated environment. But often we place deaf children in environments where we've not done an audit to determine whether in fact they're ready for an interpreted education. Many children in my particular study have talked about the friendship circles. And they've said that in grade one, grade two, grade three, yes, they had a few friends. Many of them could fingerspell, they could sign a little bit. But in the younger years, the language of play isn't as critical. It's the physical aspects of play that's not necessarily mediated by language. But once we get to about grade three, grade four, what happens with female language circles? The friendships become language-based. And those hearing girls then don't have the sign language to include the deaf child, and so the deaf child starts to feel excluded from those friendship circles. Now many of you in this audience today have had lifelong friends that were formed from your earliest years of growing up in the school for the deaf. You've had those friendship circles where you could communicate directly and create friendships that were meaningful. Meaningful friendships that supported your learning. But when we look at the inclusive environments, many of the deaf children report that they do not have a social circle. They don't have that safety net. I have said earlier as well too that many of the teachers lack the formal training in terms of how to teach a deaf learner. They have no idea what to do. And so they approach it from a perspective of non-initiation. They don't know anything about American Sign Language. They don't know anything about language acquisition for a child who's a visual learner who may use a sign language. And I would say that the majority of the teachers that were included in my study as well have different expectations of the deaf child. And by different, I mean that they have lower expectations of that deaf child. So many times they say, well, the child can't read or write, just part of being a deaf kid. And we know that's not true, but we know that many of those uh, mislabeled aspects of the child then tremendously influence that child's educational experience. So instead of raising them up to high expectations, they're pulled down to the lowest expectations. And these are challenges across the country. A further challenge is that of educational policies. For example, there are some families who have child children who uh, are offered a cochlear implant. And when they accept the cochlear implant, they're told that they absolutely cannot sign. 
and that they will lose their funding for any additional supports if they use sign language. That tremendously affects the child's educational experience. It blocks their experience in obtaining a bilingual education, an education where they might learn to both speak and sign. We have many bilingual programs in Canada, French, Italian, and it's a positive thing to learn two languages. Our world perceives bilingual or multilingual competency in a positive way, but somehow our government policies suggest that for deaf children, bilingualism is not a positive aspect, that it's important that they be monolingual, that they just learn to speak. So there's complexities around the policy levels. The other piece, of course, that's complex is the skill level that the interpreters come with and the interpreter training background that they have. So for example, many of the interpreters who are trained in Canada are trained to work with adults. They're not trained to work with children. And many of those interpreters, in my study as well too, do not have formal educational backgrounds other than interpreter training. So they don't have, for example, degrees in education. They don't understand pedagogy. They don't understand uh, early language acquisition. Some of you in the audience know exactly what I'm talking about because you are teachers. Teachers modify their language in order to engage learners in many different ways for many different purposes. But many of the interpreters in my study don't recognize that purposeful language or those purposeful strategies used by teachers. Next slide, please. Ah, yes, I apologize. I'm not a tall woman, and so apparently we're coming in with something that can make me taller. Is that better? Can people see me better now? I know it means a little bit of uh, you looking up now to see me, and I apologize for that. So as I was saying, there were a number of influences on the deaf child's educational experience. And the majority of schools that I speak with talk about an interpreter means that the child has equal access. It means that they have different access. It doesn't mean that they have equal access, but that's the view of the school, is that an interpreter means equal access. Betsy Winston, Dr. Betsy Winston, is a researcher in the United States who's looked at mediated education. And she's written a great deal about the myth of an interpreted education. And when we apply that myth to education, she talks about interpreters as a little bit like the elephant in the room. And the problem is that many of our educational problems start with the interpreter. One of the other problems often, though, is between teachers and principals, parents and interpreters, it's about expectations. So parents will place their student their child in a school and parents will tell me, my school is completely accessible. Well, recently I had an opportunity to visit the EC Drury School for the Deaf in Ontario, where everything is accessible. The environment is accessible, the signaling light systems are accessible, just as we were talking about earlier in the presentation. And so there's the lighting system that provides a warning that it's a lockdown or we have an emergency and so it's completely accessible. The deaf child doesn't have to rely on a hearing child to get the message of what's going on in the school. But yet the principals tell me, absolutely everything's accessible. But I look around, and no one in the office can sign to the deaf child. They can't have a direct conversation with the child at all. But from the principal's perception, the child is physically placed. They've got an interpreter. It's accessible. One of the other challenges is that many parents assign an interpreter to the learning environment, but they have no idea what it means to learn language from a child's perspective. So many people believe that the deaf child can learn language through an interpreter, but we don't learn language by watching language. It's one of those myths that teachers hold, that parents hold, that a principal holds, that learning language is possible through an interpreter. And it simply is not true. We don't learn language with one language model. One of the other challenges that I've raised on this slide that emerged in the research was that of budget cuts, of course. And 
we sometimes see this in Canada and in other countries where deafness is talked about as a low incidence. And so a low incidence means that we can't possibly spend that money. That's a very different view than looking at language rights from a human rights perspective. Now, I live in Calgary at the current time, and we have many families who have moved from other countries who have deaf children and have a different cultural background. And again, those cultural backgrounds frame how they view the deaf child. So for some cultures, they view deafness as a punishment. They view it as they must have sinned or they want the child to speak in the language so that they can learn the particular religious beliefs of the family. And so all of those cultural factors have an impact on learning as well. I'm just waiting for the interpreter to catch up there. We certainly have systemic problems as well. Many of the policies now relate to implanting children. But we don't support families to learn sign language in the same way. I'll give you one example of a family in Calgary. So we had a family who chose not to have an implant. But they also knew that the government typically supports families to the tune of about $30,000 for each implant. So they asked for that same amount of financial support for the family to learn sign language in their home, and that was denied. Part of that relates to attitudinal policies related to language. And again, we have people who make policies based on the idea that spoken language should be privileged over sign language. Lastly, I've got systemic uh, problems here. So in the classroom, we've talked about the fact that for many of the children, they don't know what it means to have a deaf classmate. They view them as different. They don't understand what their learning needs are. So for example, in the classroom, there'll be lots of overlapping conversation, but within that overlapping conversation, there is no opportunity for the sign language interpreter to get in there in order to interpret. So the deaf child does not have access. So when we think about learning language, I'd like us to turn our attention to for a deaf child and how they learn language. So those of you who are here who have deaf children, deaf families, for me that's a natural language learning environment. The child has exposure to sign language from the moment of birth. So for many hearing families who don't know sign language and are confronted with having a deaf child, the child does not have equal access to the learning environment. And so those families may have an implant and they'll assume that their child is then going to hear. Well, it may mean that they hear some things at some point in some environments, in some situations, but it doesn't mean that they have complete linguistic access. And so the language learning is not compatible with the environment in the same way that it would be in a typical language learning environment. Many of the deaf children in my study, and in the United States and other countries as well too, have limited opportunities in those inclusive environments to be a language communicator, to express themselves. Now when we think about how we've all learned language, we learn language by engaging with others, by talking to other people, by communicating with other people. So if the child has limited opportunities to communicate with other people, so they watch the interpreter six hours a day, but they very rarely have opportunities to engage in conversation directly with other students, or they may answer a question, say one sentence, is that a natural language learning environment? It isn't, and so that's a huge challenge for many of our deaf learners. So, with those being the challenges, then I think we have to really look at what does it mean to teach a deaf child in those environments. For me, access is not simply placing an interpreter into the classroom. Access for me means that the child can learn, that they can engage with others, that they can socially uh, engage with others. That to me is what access means. It's not just simply hiring an interpreter. So I chose engagement theory as one of the ways to frame my study. 
And so within engagement theory, there are three levels. So social engagement means how do I relate to other children? How do I relate to adults in the environment? Academic engagement is how do I relate to the curriculum? How do I relate to the teaching processes? And intellectual engagement is how do I gain that intellectual curiosity about what I'm learning? So when we think about social engagement, it really is about how much do I belong in this school? And so when we think about the deaf child in the school, do they have friends? Are they able to hold conversations directly that aren't mediated with an interpreter? Do they have access to other peers in the classroom? That might be an environment where they belong, where they feel like they belong. But many of the students in inclusive environments have no social opportunities with other peers. The question is then, do they belong in the same way? So given that the interpreter leaves the school at 3.30 and the child may want to engage in extracurricular activities after school, but has no communication access, do they belong? That's the question. In terms of academic engagement, that really speaks to how do we ensure that children are moving along in learning the curriculum alongside their hearing peers. So many of the deaf students who come into our classrooms are already behind some of their hearing peers based on those early language experiences. And so teachers often lower the expectations and socially promote students through the curriculum without them really learning the curriculum. That third level of engagement, known as intellectual engagement, refers to that idea that each of us become very curious about what we think. We get curious about learning. We take a stand about this is right or this is wrong. I want to know more about this. That intellectual engagement is critically uh, critical thinking tied all together. One of the girls in my study, I think, was in grade five. And at that time, she said, I want to quit school. At grade five, you want to quit school. So I probed a bit about that. And what she said was that her experience had been that she'd had the same interpreter, the same face, for five years. Grades one through five. That interpreter was not formally trained as an interpreter. And so the student was getting maybe half of the information based on the ineptitude of the person who was signing. The deaf girl said that she had some friends in the early years, but now that she's in grade five, she doesn't have any friends. Her only friend is the interpreter. So when we think about language and learning, would we call that an inclusive environment? Obviously, for me, it's important that students have those three levels of engagement if we're going to call it inclusion. And so for deaf children, some of them in my study, for example, instead of being an active participant, they are moved to a bystander status, which means that they are simply watching. They're not actively engaged in the learning. They're not actively engaged in responding. They're not actively engaged with their peers. They are a bystander, and that is a huge challenge then for learning. I sometimes speak at different schools, and one of the things that I like to emphasize is that if you think that your school is inclusive, I'd like you to think about what does that mean? Because it's sometimes the illusion of inclusion. People look over and they see somebody signing, and they think it's inclusive. But it's not, because the child is not engaged at those three levels that I just spoke about. But I think across Canada, many of us feel frustrated. We are advocating for educational change, and I think many of you in this room have advocated for change here in Saskatchewan. And congratulations for the wins that you have had in advancing education. I see that you have a bilingual school education program, 
and uh, I see the Deaf Crows program. So there are some significant changes here. But across Canada, we see that there is this constant advocating for educational change that doesn't seem to get us different results. And I think part of that is because we look at the deaf child not from a linguistic rights framework, but from a special education framework. We all have a right to language. And so what I've got on this slide is that the World Federation of the Deaf, the WFD, has an outstanding research paper. It's evidence-based, so research-based, and has been co-authored by a Canadian researcher, Dr. Kristen Snodden, who has been involved in the writing of this research brief. And when you look at it, I think it's significant because it is a tool for you and I to use in terms of lobbying for educational change. Canada is a signatory to the UN CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And within it, there are a number of tenets that speak to one's human rights to access language. And so language rights for people with disabilities. And if you look at the UNCRPD, sign language is mentioned more than eight times. The right of a child to a sign language education is in that convention. So the UNCRPD is a significant tool, but yet many of us have never read it. We're not using the power of that particular document in order to lobby governments, to hold them to account for what's in that convention. And we're hoping very soon that the governments will approve here, the federal government will approve American Sign Language and Langue de Sign de Québécois, which is great, but that's not enough. We need to be using the UNCPRD in order to affect educational change. Next slide, please. I know that the print here is too small for you to be able to read, but when you have the PowerPoint, you can have a look at it and go back to the original document. But again, it really emphasizes that per the UNCRPD, there are a number of factors that determine whether the environment is truly inclusive and whether the child's language rights are being met. So one of the first language rights is the right to have access to a bilingual education in a signed language. It also speaks to the right to have a direct education, not an interpreted education, but access to teachers who can sign directly to the students. It also speaks to the ability to have an environment where the child can communicate with their peers in sign language. It also has another tenant in it that speaks to the idea of uh, studying sign language as a subject in school. So studying American Sign Language or LSQ as a school subject is part of an inclusive education that supports the child's language rights. It also uh, really emphasizes the need for us to promote uh, deaf teachers to become deaf teachers. We certainly see that not meaning to insult anyone in the room, but many of our deaf teachers are approaching the age of retirement. So like me, we're getting a little older, longer in the tooth, and so we're looking to the next generation. Chrissy Steele is in the audience. I know you're one of our younger teachers. But uh, I spoke with one of the young men in the Deaf Crows group, Alex, who's interested in becoming a deaf teacher in the future. Fabulous. We need more deaf teachers. And so... As well, it also addresses the idea of supporting families in learning sign language. And so the point is that if the child has access to a meaningful education from kindergarten to grade 12, that then allows them access to a post-secondary education. But if that foundation is weak from K to 12, then those children do not find their way to college or university. So I used to work at the University of Alberta, and for a period of time I worked with Roger Carver, who's at the back of the room. And at that time, in those years, we had many deaf students studying at the undergraduate, the master's, and at the PhD level. We had a very large number of deaf students who were studying there at that time. It was fabulous. But now, if you were to go on campus and ask how many deaf students there are, there are actually no deaf students attending university at this time. Well, where are those deaf students? 
And it's interesting, I was just in Ontario and I was speaking with uh, Gary Malkowski. And in terms of the Ontario picture, we're not seeing deaf students go to post-secondary environments as well. And the trend seems to be the more that we put deaf students in K-12 to with interpreters, the less we see those students going to post-secondary, which should cause us for cause for reflection, I think. I think I've said this already. So what I'd like to do now is share some of the statistical analysis uh, from my study. So there are 42 children in my study, all of whom use sign language interpreters. And we also have some videos of deaf teachers teaching directly. So we're able to do the contrast between direct instruction and mediated instruction. And so is the interpreter the problem or the solution? And for me, I think the interpreter is often the problem. Because when we think about learning, yes, adults can absolutely learn by watching an interpreter. But can children in the same way? Not in the same way. So as I said, I've had the experience of being a teacher myself, so I've had the experience of teaching students directly. And I'm intensely curious about how interpreters manage the interpreting process to deal with the teaching functions. Because you as teachers, you use purposeful language. You ask your metacognitive questions in particular ways. You structure the curriculum to scaffold student learning. You decide how to use your teaching language and what your everyday conversations will look like in that classroom. Behind every instruction, there is a purpose. And so the reality is, can interpreters recognize that and then represent it? The first question to ask in the study was, is the interpreter qualified? Where did they take their training? Many of the interpreters in uh, my study, I think 28 of them are formally trained as interpreters. And so if we were to look at them, we would say, yes, you're a qualified interpreter. You meet the qualifications to be an educational interpreter. But if you are to dig a little deeper, none of those interpreters have any formal training on education, pedagogy with children. So those of us who are teachers, we've taken courses in language acquisition, language planning, language preparation, teaching instruction, uh, per differentiated instruction. But the interpreters are operating on a word sign model. They hear the teacher say a word, they sign a word, which may not realize any of those teaching functions. The other question to ask is who is supervising the interpreters in those educational contexts? So, Many of those schools hire the interpreters, but there is nobody who is supervising them who's qualified, who knows sign language, who knows interpretation. And many of those teachers and interpreters may have been qualified in the initial stages, and then after a few years, they stop socializing in the community, their language skills fossilize, they start to approach the job as a nine to five, and they're often protected by unions, even though they may not be linguistically competent anymore. Many of the interpreters as well spoke about that they want professional development that's targeted for their needs. But when they go to teachers' convention, they're with the educational assistants, and there aren't any courses. You know, they might learn how to weave baskets, they might learn how to do crafts, but it's not instruction that's particular to their needs as sign language interpreters. People who are not qualified but working as interpreters, for example, there are some educational assistants in rural environments that are working. And some of them have had only 60 hours of ASL instruction. So they might have taken sign language from John Warren, for example, or Chrissy Steele. So they've had good sign language instruction. And I've certainly taken more than 60 hours. I've got 120 hours of French. But still, what can I do with French? I can order a glass of wine, find a washroom, buy a postage stamp. That's it. I talk as if I'm two years of age in my spoken French. And the same parallel can be drawn for those who have 60 hours of American Sign Language instruction. 
We then hire them to interpret, but they're not qualified. They don't have enough language, let alone interpreting skills. So that girl that I spoke about in grade five who wanted to quit, she had an EA, and that EA actually learned sign language from a book, from a dictionary is how she learned sign. Yes, she was very motivated. She'd come to take ASL immersions in the summer uh, at the University of Alberta. She was motivated to learn, but it's not enough. She's the one person in that rural environment who knows a bit of sign language. And so how is it for the deaf child to learn natural language? But the principal in that school said, it's great. The child's really happy. I thought, have you asked the child? The child's ready to leave school at grade five. I don't think that reflects happiness. Most of the interpreters in my study, there are two who have deaf family members, so have got more natural-like language use. But most of them are like me. They are hearing people who met deaf people maybe and got interested in sign language and learned it later in life, after the age of 18. So for those of us who did that, we are L2 learners of American Sign Language, which means that they are not good language models in the classroom. They're not. So I will always have an accent in my use of American Sign Language, as opposed to Greg DeRoche, who spoke earlier, who is a very fluent natural language user. As a hearing person, I'm very fluent in American Sign Language. I can certainly use it in a teaching environment and in a social environment, but I will always have an accent. And so many of the interpreters in my study, the problem is, are they qualified? But also, what are their beliefs about language and language acquisition? So if they believe that deaf children can learn language by watching a language model who maps English words with signs in English order, that's not going to result in a good education for that child. Signing exact English has been in use for some 35 years, but we still don't have evidence that it's done anything to support the learning of English language literacy skills for deaf children. That transmission model reflects a belief. When we speak about transmission model, it means that I'm just hearing a word and I'm signing a word, but it doesn't mean that the child's going to learn language from that model. For this particular study, I chose six language functions. There are many more that I could have chosen from, but I chose six common teaching functions. And these are ways that teachers use language, asking metacognitive questions designed to promote critical thinking. Secondly, the use of scaffolding techniques in terms of how do we, as teachers, design our instructions so that we bring students along based on what they know while introducing new knowledge to them. How do teachers as well reconceptualize so they might know that a student's not understanding something and they'll re say it in another way? Teachers also use sequencing strategies in order to uh, perform in the classroom. And so they will sequence instructions in ways that break it down for the learner. Peer teaching is also a really important part of a classroom dialogue. So students teach each other through their own language use. And so that's an important part of the classroom. And so the peer instruction has to be critically analyzed in terms of how do kids learn from each other? And then what are interpreters doing that manage those strategies? And so you as teachers as well know how to use feedback that can positively encourage somebody or that can correct them and bring them back on track. And so that feedback can keep students engaged in the learning. So I took those six common teaching functions and it doesn't matter whether teachers are speaking in English, speaking in French, speaking in American Sign Language. These are functions that are all used by good teachers. And so then I analyzed the videotapes uh, using this sociolinguistic frame. Next uh, slide. So as I said earlier, they're qualified, trained interpreters in this study. But look at the percentages. So the first column 
uh, shows what the teaching function was. The second column shows a percentage based on accuracy and effectiveness. And the third column indicates ineffective or inaccurate work. Then look at the percentages. So in terms of the trained interpreters, 88% of the time we're still missing the metacognitive questions, which is to say that the interpreters are either not recognizing them or they're sometimes substituting a lower ordered question. So instead of asking a why question, which is to designed to promote critical thinking, they'll change the question to a what question, which is a very different question. It doesn't ask them why something happens, it asks them what happens, which interferes with the child's development of critical thinking. So when we see that it's inaccurate or wrong, that amount of time, that's a huge problem. Scaffolding, we see as well similar percentages. 86% of the time, it's not handled well. You're not seeing the scaffolding because of the quick transmission, sign after sign after sign, but it's not visually broken down in the same way that you hear the pauses in spoken English that scaffold the meaning. Peer discussions, so the interpreter in the small group discussions, those did not go well for the majority of interpreters because what we saw is that the hearing students forget that the deaf student is part of the group. So they're all talking at the same time. They're all talking at the same time. The interpreter basically just gives up because it cannot be followed. So they start throwing in snippets of signs, but it's just signs. It doesn't mean anything for the deaf student and it certainly doesn't promote inclusion. Then the idea that teachers reconceptualize or explain things in different ways. So again, we see a very high percentage of the time where that's not working. It's not present. When I interviewed the interpreters after, many of them said, well, I don't have time to get all of that in. Plus, it felt like repetition, so I just eliminated it. That's not what we want interpreters to do because that extra explanation may be the explanation that's needed for that child at a given moment. And that may be the time that they actually understand what the teacher is talking about. And lastly, the area of feedback, again, a consistent problem where the interpreters are working simultaneously. So they're working very quickly to represent the English into sign language and they're missing the feedback. But the feedback, because of their processing time, they've missed it. And so when I asked interpreters about that as well too, they said, well, it's my catch-up time, I didn't get it in, or it wasn't directed at the deaf teacher, or it wasn't directed at the deaf student. But yet it is directed at every student in the classroom. The hearing students are seeing that student who answered and got the answer wrong, but still got supported. So that helps students learn how to navigate the, the classroom. So if the deaf student has no access to that feedback, there are opportunities to feel inspired or to feel engaged or to connect isn't there. The language functions are crucial. And we have two students uh, in this who were not particularly part of my study but happened to be in the class while I was videotaping one of the interpreters. One of those students has a cochlear implant. It was in a grade eight class and the other was hard of hearing. So I was focused on the deaf student who was using the sign language interpreter. But I could see that the two other students were coming out of their seats and watching the interpreter. They would lean out into the aisle and watch the interpreter. And they were doing that because it gave them access to the language of instruction. Because they know sign language and the child who is coded to have a sign language interpreter, has an interpreter in the classroom, they could take advantage of that. The child with the cochlear implant and the child who's hard of hearing said that the classroom is so noisy that they can't hear anything. So by watching the interpreter, it gave them more complete access. So for children who are hard of hearing and who have cochlear implants, that visual support can be just so, so important. And they have a language right as well in that classroom. The interpreters who were actually successful at interpreting in the classroom, we then looked at 
what was their experiential variables that they might have in common? Two of them were nationally certified by ALVLIC, holding a certificate of interpretation. Two of them had deaf family members, so had natural language acquisition from a younger age. And all of them who were successful also still had a relationship in terms of socializing in the adult deaf community, which means that they were seeing language as it evolves and then going back to the classroom and applying that language use with their students. And so those who are very tied to a word sign model don't have that language access. They don't see the natural language use. Students don't get natural language use. They don't understand what's going on in the classroom. From the 42 students uh, that were uh, included in the school, we noticed that six were very academically doing very, very well. And when analyzing what those students were doing well at, we found that there were four factors in common across those students. All of them could read or write at the same level as their hearing peers, which meant that they could accommodate for inadequate or inappropriate interpreting because they could read the material. Six of those children also had experienced direct education, so they may have attended a congregated school for the deaf, um, a, a school for the deaf that had a classroom of deaf students, but they'd had direct instruction for several years in their early years. All of them as well had communication at home, which meant that they could go home and talk to their parents about their day. And their parents may not have been fabulous signers, but there was sufficient communication to create a relationship and a relationship of trust. And so that the parents could then support the students with their homework and could listen to their frustrations and could support them through their experience with inclusion. And uh, as well, those students also had friends outside of the inclusive environments, deaf friends. So those who had been through programs with other deaf students had maintained friendships and so that they had friends out of school that they could connect with in the evenings and weekends. So, If that is the picture, what are we to do? I think the first thing that we have to do is that we all need to be honest about whether a situation can be interpreted. Is this a suitable environment? And so that requires interpreting audits. So one of the first questions to ask in interpreting audit is, is the child ready for a mediated education? And is, if yes, is the teacher ready to teach a deaf student? So many of us assume that, again, we just hire the interpreter, and it means that absolutely everything can be interpreted. And it's simply untrue. It's not possible to interpret absolutely everything in every situation. I'll give you an example from one of the schools. The teacher had a very, very strong Russian accent, very strong accent, which meant that the interpreters were really struggling to understand the teacher. When the interpreter does not understand, they cannot interpret. But the high school said, well, just do your best. Even though it's a difficult environment, do your best. Is that access? I think not. Now, sometimes things can be interpreted if we modify the situation. So, for example, if teachers are, uh, we had one teacher who was really unaware of how to teach uh, deaf students, but was able to modify the classroom to ask students to raise their hands, which allowed the deaf student a chance to look over and see who was answering the question before watching the interpreter. But there are other teachers who wouldn't modify practice. So they would write on the board while talking all the time, which meant that the child either had to look at the board or look at the interpreter, but they couldn't do both. So if teachers are willing to modify their practice, it may be an environment that can be interpreted. But some environments require tremendous change. So one of the students in my uh, class studied at a gifted and talented program. And in that classroom, for me, as I looked around in that environment, it required a great deal of modification in order for it to be accessible. 
And the reason for that is that there were 17 gifted and talented students, and all of them really wanted to talk at the same time. And all of them had very, very clever things to say. And all of them were reading at such an advanced level and reading such diverse things that they were bringing those materials into the classroom. The teacher was using a variety of materials, some of them movies without captions. So there were a number of modifications required in order for the student to have what we would say is equal access. And other times it's simply impossible to interpret. And so by doing those audits of the classroom, we have to be able to be able to check all of those boxes in order to determine whether it's appropriate for interpretation. Now, have a look at this fabulous t-shirt. I just love what's happening here in Saskatchewan. And again, this is another way of where we have modified or reformed education. So what I see in that is Joanne Weber is teaching through an arts-based, a drama-based instruction, but teaching all of the curriculum to those learners. And those are learners who are learning to think critically, acquiring language, using language with other students who use sign language. So they are acquiring all of it through an arts-based approach. So well done, Joanne Weber in Saskatchewan. But again, remember that I said that many of our policies restrict deaf children from having access to a bilingual education. So again, I think we have to use tools like the UNCRPD in order to gain access to bilingual education. I could have given my presentation today in spoken English, or I can give it in American Sign Language. I have that privilege of using two, language, two languages. Does the deaf child have that same privilege of using either spoken language if they choose, written language, or a sign language? So many of the resources that I've put in the slides that uh, come are from Gallaudet University, from the VL2 lab. So there are Canadian researchers who are also working in the VL2 lab, and there are outstanding resources, great video presentations about bilingual learning theory, about deaf children who are implanted, about how to support learners in the classroom. So there's great information, and I think we should be using that with our schools and with our teachers. We also have research from other countries that shows children with cochlear implants who use a signed language have increased cognitive abilities, increased language skills, increased critical thinking skills, and that ability to learn. And so we need to be able to know that research and use it in our Canadian situations. So I've put a number of resources and tools in for you. These are some ideas about what good teachers with deaf children can do to modify their instructional strategies in order to accommodate a deaf learner in the classroom. So I said that we have samples of teachers teaching directly in American Sign Language and we have samples on video of interpreted education. And when I analyze the direct education, there are some very different linguistic strategies that the teachers are using. And one of them is about pacing and making students uh, have an accessible environment based on an environment where the information is paced, where all eyes are looking at the teacher at one time, where they're managing the turn taking, and so where they're providing that enriched uh, background or context information. And so the pace is really important because it's tied to the cognitive load or the cognitive processing. The enriched instruction, so being able to provide that background information. So many of the teachers who are deaf intuitively know the gaps that a child brings when they come to school. Many of our deaf children come with significant educational gaps and they know how to fill them in. And so they know how to reduce the dual demands of looking in two different places at the same time. And so teachers who are deaf know how to manage those dual task demands. One of the funny stories that I had uh, happen in, in the study is that I observed a teacher who was doing a science experiment in one of the classrooms. And on that particular day, the interpreter was a little bit behind. And so they managed to get the instructions for the first step, the second step, and the third step 
correct. And then they introduced the fifth or sixth step into the fourth place, which meant that the student got very different instructions than their hearing peers. And of course, their experiment it sort of exploded. And uh, the teacher said, I, I did what I was supposed to do, but the interpreter had misplaced that sequence. So eyes on the interpreter, eyes on other students, eyes for reading the board, knowing how to manage uh, the eye gaze is an important strategy for teachers to learn as well too. Let's take the next slide. Uh, good instructors, and we certainly do have some good instructors in inclusive environments or mainstream environments, and these are some of the things that they do. So some of them find ways to work with the interpreters as a good team mate. So they talk about the class preparation, not just hand it over and say, read this, but they talk about, these are my instructional goals. This is what I'm hoping to have the students do. Do you know how to do this in sign language? So they really do talk with the interpreters about their pedagogy. They also find ways to learn some social signs. So how to say good morning, to greet the deaf child directly, how to provide some feedback that said, that's great, do that. So they build in a direct connection. One of the teachers does that through text-based communication. So they text back and forth with the student in order to have that direct communication. Good teachers also provide good visual support. Again, things that can help the student learn visually, not just relying on the interpreter. As well, they know how to design instruction that's differentiated, that meets all of the needs of the learners. And I know Michael Pidrabeski in the room and he's just finished off a master's. And so differentiated instruction is a big topic of many of our graduate programs these days. Many of the teachers as well who are good at uh, dealing with deaf students are those who are willing to switch their attitude and accommodate the deaf student, not expect the student to just do what all the hearing students are doing, but to change their teaching methods to accommodate the student's learning needs. And so there are some things that it's really difficult or it's impossible to modify because you've got so many students in the classroom, but teachers who are really willing to modify to all of their learners and meet them where the students are, are the good instructors. Many of you in this room know that uh, what good deaf teachers do is what's highlighted on this slide. So obviously they're good language models, that they know how to engage students. We've got some good video samples of uh, teachers who are deaf, who are using their dominant hand, their right hand, to teach the content and using their left hand to provide feedback or to guide students to keep them engaged. That two-handed approach to language use in a purposeful teaching way is not something that interpreters know how to do. As well, deaf teachers wait longer. So they allow the deaf student that visual processing time. They're visually processing a visual language before they expect a response, as opposed to the interpreters are working at the same language pace as the hearing students, which doesn't allow the student to process it and then respond. One of the schools in my study, which I think is interesting as well too, um, has an interesting process So, uh, yes, Chrissy, you're from Alberta School for the Deaf. So they are serving a student in a rural environment in, in rural Alberta where they're trying to figure out what portion of the day can be handled through direct instruction and what portion can be handled with an interpreter. And so I think they're using Skype or some video conferencing process for math and language arts so that that student can see other deaf students, that they can see a teacher teaching directly in sign language. And so they have a few hours of the day, three hours of the day, that's direct instruction, and another three hours that's with an interpreter, so to speak. So it may not be ideal, but it is an option. And we're certainly seeing more and more of the remote interpreting happen because schools have such a shortage of interpreters these days. But Asking students to watch an interpreter on a video screen is not the same as being actively engaged in the classroom. I think it's important as well, lastly, to talk about having a deaf-centered curriculum. Deaf students need to see themselves reflected in the instruction, 
here you see a list. And across Canada, we have many deaf people who are significant role models who have done interesting things. And here in Saskatchewan, there's a long list, as you'll see here, I've just chosen a few. And so you'll see that first picture there is of Shelley Carver. I don't know if she's in the room. I know Roger is. Shelley, I guess, is still over in the deaf expo room. But Roger and Shelley were some of the first deaf people that I had the pleasure of meeting in Edmonton. They were some of the first deaf leaders that taught me how to interpret. I didn't graduate from an interpreter education program. I graduated from the deaf community teaching me how to interpret. That school of hard knocks is what made me a good interpreter, thanks to people like Roger and Shelley. Roger and Shelley have been tremendous leaders, not just in Saskatchewan, Vancouver, but across Canada. And I think deaf children need to know those stories. They need to know the ways that deaf people have contributed to the community, just as Greg was talking about history this morning. When deaf children can see a deaf historian, it can spark that interest of, I could also be a deaf teacher, or I could be a historian. Could you go back to the previous slide, please? Burton Bird, yes, you're in the room as well, too. And so uh, Burton is a great role model for our deaf children to learn about because deaf kids get to see a chance to see a First Nations dancer, hoop dancer. Teachers, we've got people like Leslie Joe uh, in Saskatchewan. Yes, right there. John Warren, absolutely outstanding videographer, um, did the bilingual books that I saw in the Deaf Expo room filming today. Maybe Allard, yes, not in the room, but uh, Allard Thomas, one of our elders. He taught for many years through the School for the Deaf. And so as an older role model, he has stories that are important to pass on to the, our deaf children in this current generation. Many deaf kids see oh, deaf people can do these things. But there is also a new face of deaf leadership. So this woman is a deaf doctor. She is Canada's first deaf doctor. She's also of First Nations heritage. And so I think it's important that our deaf kids realize that they can become doctors. They shouldn't have messages that say it's impossible. Anything's possible. And we now have two deaf doctors, one in Manitoba, one in British Columbia. Yes, I think, uh, Sue, you've hosted the Dragonfly Camp here in Saskatchewan. You've had a deaf youth camp. And so those camps are just so, so important because it's a chance for children from mainstream environments, inclusive environments, to come and be with other deaf children. A chance for them to have that experience and build that identity. I know our time is running uh, out here this afternoon. So in the PowerPoint, when you have a look at it, there's a number of different resources, and we'll just touch on a couple as we uh, wrap this up today. This is a resource at the University of Alberta. They have a number of video tutorials. They're in spoken English and in American Sign Language, designed for teachers who are working in inclusive environments. So they provide information to teachers that I think can be helpful. There's also video tutorials for those who are teaching uh, oral deaf students with cochlear implants. This is a literacy curriculum. Uh, many teachers are at a loss in terms of curriculum instruction for deaf learners, and so this is a literacy inst uh, instructional tool. Uh, another resource on uh, helpful apps. These are all about bilingual books, and again, I saw a sample of a fabulous bilingual book done here in Saskatchewan. And John Warren, I think you filmed it. It's absolutely beautiful. What a great school project. And bilingual books can be just such a crucial thing for language acquisition. And we see them in use around the world. I chose this resource from British Columbia because it's a very strong parents organization. And that particular organization was founded by none other than Roger Carver again. And so the family uh, network, family network for deaf children in British Columbia is a great resource for parents. You can look at their website, you can uh, join some of their programs, they have great uh, resources. And last, 
What I would want to say in summary is that if we want children to have a solid, good quality education for deaf, hard of hearing, children with cochlear implants, children who sign, we need to look at language acquisition environments. Children have to have opportunities to use language as communicators. They have to be able to communicate with their peers, with their adults in that environment in order to be able to learn language. And for deaf children, a good education also means having social opportunities, having a social network, having friendships. We also need to pay attention to those three levels of engagement, social, academic, and intellectual engagement. When we can check all three of those boxes, we might be able to say we've got a good inclusive education. When we're not checking those boxes, we're not getting a full education. Lastly, we require some attitudinal changes. In terms of our inclusive education, we have to think about how do we accommodate the child as opposed to how do they accommodate us. We have to think about professional interpreters, which means that interpreters require specialized training about language of instruction, purposeful language use, pedagogical strategies, how instruction happens through mediation. So I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for your interest in my topic and congratulations. Well, thank you for inviting me.